this point in time, I'd like to call this meeting of the Board of Chosen Freeholders to order. Please rise for a moment of silence and uh, pray for the safe return of our servicemen and women. Dennis Luther Flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Notice of this meeting pursuant to the Open Public Meetings Act, NJSA 10 colon 4 10, has been complied with and shall be entered into the minutes of this meeting. Roll call. Freeholder Barrett. Freeholder Delina. Freeholder Polos, Freeholder Rios, here. Freeholder Scott, Freeholder Valenti, here. Freeholder Director Rafano, here. At this point in time, I understand there's some commemorative resolutions. Yes. Margaret. The first is a resolution in memoriam of Arthur W. Dando, retired Woodbridge Township Police Captain. Next is recognizing the 64th anniversary of India's Independence Day. Next is recognizing the New Brunswick Area Branch of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People on the occasion of their 37th Annual Freedom Fund Luncheon. Next is recognizing the Smithereens Band as they celebrate their 30th anniversary. And last is recognizing Jacob Marks and Asher Marks of Troop 55 as they have attained their Eagle Scout Awards. I need a motion. So moved. Second. Motion by <laughs> Deputy Director Rio, seconded by Freeholder Valente. Roll call. Freeholder Delina? Yes. Freeholder Rios? Yes. Freeholder Valenti? Yes. Freeholder Director Rafano? Yes. Deputy Director? If the Dando family would come up to the podium over here, please. Or Mrs. Dando? We have a resolution here that we passed tonight, and uh, this was an important one. Uh, Arthur W. Dando was a retired police captain from Woodbridge Police Department, and uh, I've known Art for probably 40 years. We have became very close the last 30 years, and uh, I think it was important that we share with everyone Art's memory because he was a special person. He was a Korean War veteran, and he served on the USS Tarawa. And I didn't even have to look at the resolution to say that because I remember the stories that Art would say about his proud service in the Navy. And uh, again, he was a police captain, rose to the ranks of every uh, office in the police de uh, department of Woodbridge Township. And he was involved with the PBA. He was on the pistol team probably an expert many times throughout his career and won many awards. He was a member of the Knights of Columbus, Don Bosco Knights of Columbus in Port Reading, and he was a member and officer of Raritan Bay Rod and Gun Club. But what's important to know, for everyone to know, is that uh, Art Dando, he epitomized the word police officer. He epitomized the word father. He epitomized the word friend, and he really epitomized the word husband and family. And that's important for everyone to know that he was a role model for a lot of people and uh, certainly a good role model for police officers and to know that uh, worked with Art, that he uh, really had a, a special place on this earth and he will sorely be missed. And I just wanted to present this resolution to his widow, Dorothy. Director, I'd like to second that. I knew Artie a long time. He was a great police officer and a great humanitarian in Woodbridge. He was always he was a friend of the people and always helped people out what he could do. But he was a great man. That's why I want to thank you. Thank you. 
At this point in time, we need to deviate from the regular order of business to consider three resolutions. Margaret. Um, the first resolution is 10-1434. Mm -hmm. Appoint Dr. Jorge Gonzalez Gomez of Sayreville as a member to the Middlesex County Cultural and Heritage Commission for a term to commence August 19, 2010 and to terminate on August 4, 2013. Next is resolution 10-1445. Amend resolution dated November 7th, 1985, creating the Middlesex County Commission on the Status of Women to make various changes and appoint members thereto. And the third resolution is 10 1496, appoint George Lisicki of Carteret to the Middlesex County College Board of Trustees to fill the unexpired term of Alberto Rivas of Perth Amboy for a term to commence August 19th, 2010, and to terminate October 31st, 2010. At this point in time, I'd like to open up to the public those three resolutions for comment. Anybody from the public? Motion to close. Second. Motion by Deputy Director Rio, seconded by Creole Valente. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Ayes have it. I need a motion to adopt resolution numbers 10 1434, 10 1445, and 10 1496 only. Motion. Second. Motion by Deputy Director Rio, seconded by Creole Valente. Roll call. Freeholder Delina? Yes. Freeholder Rios? Yes. Freeholder Valenti? Yes. Freeholder Director Rafano? Yes. Okay, at this point in time, we have to administer, administer some oaths. Yes. If Dr. <laughs> Gonzalez Gomez would come forward, please. Raise your right hand. Mm -hmm. Repeat after me. I state your name. I, Dr. Gonzalez Gomez. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And to the governments established in the United States. And to the governments established in the United States. And in this state. And in this state. Under the authority of the people. Under the authority of the people. And that I will faithfully. And that I will faithfully. Impartially and impartially justly. And justly. Perform all the duties. Perform all the duties. Of office of member of the Middlesex County Cultural and Heritage Commission. Of the office of member of the Middlesex County Cultural and Heritage Commission. According to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. Congratulations. Thank if you. I could have a signature, please. Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to say a few words? With Middlesex County being so culturally diverse, it is a pleasure to serve and thank you for the appointment. Thank you very much. We're happy to have you. I'd like to call the following individuals to come and have the oath administered as a group. Paulette Cravio Waller, Nancy Nicola, Catherine Nicola, Chanel McCollum, Deborah Wisniewski, Andrea Macaronis, Elizabeth Raspa, and Linda Vanderveer. Uh, maybe we should. Of the 
Paulette, would you like to say a few words? Um, sure. Okay. Um, I would like to thank the Board of Chosen Freeholders for reestablishing the Middlesex County Status of Women Commission. Every March during Women's History Month, the Commission will be honoring women throughout the county for their accomplishments in several ca categories. We would also hope to be an encouragement to women's groups throughout the county. And I would like to introduce, um, if I may, by since they're all up here, um, the Commission on the Status of Women. And from North Brunswick, we have Nancy Nicola. And from North Brunswick also, we have Councilwoman Kathy Nicola. We have Andrea Macaronis. From Piscataway, we have Chanel McCollum. From Highland Park, Elizabeth Raspa. From South Brunswick, Linda Vandeveer. And from Sarahville, Debbie Wisniewski. And our free older liaison, I believe, will be Blanquita Valente. And I would, if I have just one moment, I'd like to just introduce um, Councilwoman Kathy Nicola, who will read the mission statement. Thank you. Thank you. For those of you in the audience who don't know me, my name is Kathy Nicola and those listening at home on TV. I'm a councilwoman in North Brunswick and I, along with my fellow committee members, are strong pro proponents of effectuating meaningful change to aid women and the issues that affect us all throughout Middlesex County. We also wish to recognize Middlesex County women who have been instrumental to the advancement in all areas of achievement. Our mission statement is as follows. The Middlesex County Commission on the Status of Women shall advocate for all women in Middlesex County by providing an effective forum to identify and address women's issues and concerns. We will develop a greater public awareness of women's issues by sponsoring informational exchanges with an end result of enhancing the quality of life for everyone. We as a commission intend on addressing the needs and potential needs of Middlesex County women residents, identifying existing resources that may be of interest to Middlesex County women, recommend policies and programs and services to improve com uh, the commission, liaison and promote networking opportunities between existing organizations towards the improvement of this commission, develop a greater public awareness of women's issues by providing informational exchanges, sponsor an annual Citizen of the Year event to be celebrated in March, Women's History Month, recognizing Middlesex County women for their outstanding achievements, achievements in the areas of arts and entertainment, business, education, government, law, medicine, nonprofit social services, volunteerism, and special recognition. We will sponsor a Most Valuable Student Scholarship Award to a graduating female student of Middlesex County who exemplifies superior or exceptional characteristics that contribute to the specific criterion of academic achievement, work experience, community service, honors and awards, leadership, and extracurricular activities. Last, but certainly not least, on behalf of our entire committee, I would especially like to thank our county business administrator, John Palomina, who has been instrumental, thanking him for his time and his commitment to the commission, to our freeholder director, Christopher Rafano, and our freeholder liaison, Blaquita Valenti, and our entire board of chosen freeholders for their support in recreating this commission. Middlesex County is on the forefront throughout the state of New Jersey of its commitment to women as shown by its current workforce. Middlesex County has a little over 1,925 employees and 908 of them are women. That is 49% of the workforce here in Middlesex County. Additionally, of the 32 county departments, 10 departments and division heads are women. 
Our County Board of Freeholders is known for providing outstanding services for all women throughout our county. So it is most fitting to recreate this commission here this evening. So thank you for your time this evening and we look forward to serving as a resource and an advisory group to this fine board. Thank you very much. Thank you. State your name. I, George Lasicki. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. That I will bear true faith. That I will bear true faith. And allegiance to and the alle same. Allegiance to the same. And to the governments established in the United States. And to the governments established in the United States. And in this state. And in this state. Under the authority of the people. Under the authority of the people. That I will faithfully. That I will faithfully. Impartially, impartially and justly perform and justly perform all the duties of the office of all the duties of the office of member of Middlesex County College Board of Trustees member of the Middlesex County Board of Trustees according to the best of my ability according to the best of my abilities congratulations thank you very much okay, <laughs> George would you like to say a few words sure Thank you. Having served at the past National Commander of Veterans of Foreign Wars just two short years ago, I'm certainly proud and honored to have this opportunity to serve on this board of the Middlesex County College as a trustee. We in the Veterans of Foreign Wars, as you know, is our main goal is to support our veterans and their families. But also one of our major goals of the Veterans of Foreign Wars is to work in our communities. So I'm certainly proud, honored, that I got this opportunity. I thank the Board of Chosen Freeholders for giving me this opportunity, and my dear friend Ron Rios, freeholder Ron Rios, who I've known for many years, and I will do this job according to the best of my ability. And I thank you so very much for giving me the opportunity. We'll take a second in the event somebody wants to leave the meeting at this point. I would just like to add a few comments. Uh, I've known George Lasicki for a number of years, and he's a fine individual. He's been very dedicated to the ver veterans of foreign wars for all their uh, benefits and rights, and I'm sure he will be a uh, great addition to the Board of Trustees. Thank you, Freeholder. Margaret. Each freeholder has been provided with a list of correspondence received by the clerk's office since our last meeting. This correspondence will be kept on file in the office of the clerk of the board for reference. I need a motion to accept the correspondence. Second. Motion by Deputy Director Rios, seconded by Freeholder Valente. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Ayes have it. Margaret. We have received a letter from South Brunswick Township Manager Matthew Watkins requesting $455,000 in open space funds which will provide for the installation of turf fields at Rowland Park. The Township of South Brunswick will also contribute $455,000 towards this project. I need a motion to refer this correspondence to Ralph Albanier to then motion. report back to us at a future date. So moved. Second. Motion by Deputy Director Rio, seconded by Freeholder Valente. Roll call, please. Freeholder Delina? Yes. Freeholder Polos? Yes. Freeholder Rios? Yes. Freeholder Valente? Yes. Freeholder Director Rufano? Yes. <clears throat> I need a motion to accept the minutes of the July 15th and August 5th meetings. So moved. 
Second. Motion by Deputy Director Rio, seconded by Fielder Valente. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Ayes have it. Reports of freeholders. Freeholder Stephen J. Pitolina. Uh, thank you, Freeholder Director. Tonight I would like to report on several items related to the Parks Department. The Middlesex County Summer Softball League has concluded and the championship for the Sunday Men's League was the uh, team called the Big Shot Steels from my hometown, Woodbridge. I didn't play on that team, so don't worry. <laughs> Thursday the COVID League at the Garden State Hotel from the Touchin. At the end of this month, our three softball leagues will start. We will have a Sunday women's uh, league on Monday, Wednesday, thir and Tuesday. Tuesday, Thursday, and men's league. While these leagues are fully booked, you can call Aaron Duckcox at 732-745-4222 for more information. I am pleased to report that today we accepted bids from the Middlesex Greenway. The bids were within the engineering's estimate. That means that we will be starting construction on the new 3.5 mile bike walkway connecting Metuchen, Edison, Woodbridge, and Fords. See, I put Fords in. It really wasn't Fords on the paper. I don't think it was Fords, I know. Because I live in Fords, and I'm going to be walking with Angelo. That's me and Angelo, right? Okay. Uh, let's see. I am pleased to report that we, well, okay, we got that. But at our last performance of our high school musical took place last Saturday. The whole season was received with a large audience for all the three musicals that we had. But we are not finished with the performance at the Stephen J. Confessional Theater yet. We have, want to remind everyone that on September 5th, September 5th, remind, at 4 p.m., we will host the fifth annual Labor Day weekend concert. The Mahoney Brothers and the fabulous Grease Band will be performing. The concert is absolutely free and the gates will open up at 3 p.m. Don't forget to bring your lawn chair. For further information, you can call the Parks Department, 732-745-3900. And you can contact Ralph Alford here if you want. I don't have his number. He won't give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my... Cultural Heritage Report, I want to bring the board attention to resolution number 10-1283 from the Cultural Heritage Commission. The resolution provides support for the George Street Playhouse in New Brunswick. The Playhouse offers educational outreach projects in Middlesex County Schools and in the theater facility. These programs introduce young people to the theater arts and stimulate the creative thinking and build lifelong skills and discipline. I'd like to call up Jim Jacks, Director of the Education and Outreach of the George Street Playhouse, to tell us more about the worthy program that we're gonna have, okay? Let's give him a nice hand. Thank you so much for having me here. I uh, deeply appreciate the support the freeholders have shown George Street and the Education Department. Um, I am, uh, I recently became the Director of Education last November, and it's been an absolute thrill to me to find the level of uh, devotion to arts, culture, and education in Middlesex County. And so, thank you. Um, one of the things I'd like to share with you a little bit about some of the things that we have done this year with some of the funds. And this year, your support provided 6,000 students in Middlesex County the opportunity to see live theater and participate in post-show discussions and workshops, uh, exploring themes such as cyberbullying, tolerance, language acquisition, immigration, and respect. Uh, we brought a total of 21 performances to 12 schools in Middlesex County. Uh, with the most requested show being IRL, In Real Life. This is a show that we developed and commissioned at George Street that focuses on cyberbullying, which is a tremendously insidious component that's happening throughout the lives of our students um, throughout New Jersey and beyond. And this play confronts those realities and prepares students to make positive choices in how they deal with the internet and in their own lives regarding how they uh, respond to bullying. Uh, I'd love to read you a quote. Um, that Maureen McVeigh Burzok, District Supervisor of Language Arts and World Languages um, from Spotswood Public Schools, uh, sent to us following a performance of IRL that was provided by funds from the freeholders. This production was by far the most relevant and well orchestrated that I have brought to a school. The implement, uh, implementation of technology was flawless and engaged these middle schoolers in a world they are very, very familiar with. 
Um, IRL uses the technology the students are using to help tell the story of four students and how they deal with these problems. And so following the performance, the audience has offered, offered an opportunity to investigate these themes more fully. And so we deeply appreciate the commitment you have shown us in the past. The other part of the funds that you've shared with us go directly to fund our academy programs at the Playhouse. Um, this past year, we provided uh, over 300 students the opportunity to explore theater arts in our facilities over at George Street. And this summer, we had the Summer Theater Academy. And that we believe deeply in treating each student as an artist and having them investigate what the power of arts education is and how they can learn how to express themselves and um, use their imagination and, and explore creative ingenuity to solve problems. Um, one of the pro uh, programs that we had this year was called Young M Company, which we, was a four-week process, uh, five days a week, where students were creating an original musical from scratch. Uh, they developed the story, the lyrics, they created a vocal composition that they sang back to a composer, and they created a remarkable musical that investigates what it means for them to be at school right now and how they're challenged by how some other students treat them. And it's a redemptive tale in the end, but it was quite an astonishing process. And I'd love just to share with you one of the mothers who wrote to us about this, um, our student Christopher Pavone. Christopher has learned so much at the Academy this summer. Um, learned all facets of creating a musical play, from brainstorming to playwriting and even writing lyrics. His understanding um, of theater's workings and conviction of what he truly loves to do has perhaps led him to his future profession. He contacted me recently after this and is now going to be our high school directing intern for the Education Touring Company, and we'll start with us next week, and we'll offer a unique um, artistic insight uh, from a student's point of view about what it's like to be cyberbullied and how students are dealing with that in the schools. Um, other aspects of our education program is providing um, enrichment for the, the main stage shows for our adults in the Sunday symposiums. And as well, this year, we have forged a critical partnership with New Brunswick Public School to provide year-round theater arts education um, for students in third grade and sixth grade, which will be happening all throughout next year. So um, I deeply, deeply appreciate the, uh, the support you all have shown us, and it's made an enormous difference um, in the lives of so many students in this, in this county. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I want to introduce our director and assistant director of the Cultural Heritage. Anna, would you stand up? The director and Susan, would you stand up? Take a bow. Keep a nice hand. And let's see. And that's about it for my, my report. If anybody has any questions, you can see me after the meeting. You, you're, not, you're not quite done yet, Freeholder. I'd like to introduce Edison Mayor Tony Rosigliano and also Angelo Orlando, president of the Edison Art Society, to make a presentation. Thank you so much, Director. I might just for a minute say it's wonderful to come into these premises particularly when I look around at some of us older fellows who've been around for a long while, uh, the, free, the freeholder, Jack, John, and so forth, uh, brings back a lot of memories. Right, Jack? Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's really a pleasure and an honor for me to be here on behalf of the Edison Art Society. And it's been an honor for me to serve as the president for the last 11 years, and I must publicly, loudly, just commend each and every one of the members of the Board of Freeholders who've supported us for so many years, and I know they will continue to do that. And just as a matter of fact, we're putting together, the director's laughing, uh, but uh, uh, we, uh, and the assistant director's laughing also, but anyway, uh, we are uh, formulating our 2011 season, and we expect our first concert of our wonderful symphony orchestra to take place, hopefully someplace in February. But we're not here for that tonight. Uh, I want to introduce to you our executive director, Ann Redland, so she can explain uh, and give you a few words about why we're here and what the program is. Ann Redland, please. Ann. Thank you, Angelo. It's my pleasure to be here this evening. And thank you for having us. Um, we at the Edison Art Society uh, created an award. Uh, this is our third annual award, entitled the Gracious Grounds Award, given to uh, either an individual or group who enhances the quality of life through beauty in gardening, horticultural, and landscaping. And this year, our 
2010 recipient was the Middlesex County Board of Chosen Freeholders for Roosevelt Park. And I'm sure we all know how exquisitely beautiful Roosevelt Park is. It's really the treasure um, of the park system here in Middlesex County that we feel so blessed to have and to enjoy. And so um, without further ado, uh, Mayor Sigliano, would you please um, give your word? Thank you. Well, I'm very pleased and honored to be here. Good evening, freeholders, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Metuchen and Edison had a, uh, uh, traditionally has a garden um, show each year through the Art Society. And uh, this year was, again, we just saw such beautiful gardens that sometimes you don't realize the treasures that we have in individual backyards and the, um, the love and dedication that people really uh, extend to the outdoors. It is really inspiring. And I think this, um, this award to Roosevelt, um, to Roosevelt Park really epitomizes what we in Middlesex County sometimes take for granted. It's a beautiful facility and it is supported by our Board of Chosen Freeholders. We thank you for that. And this, this plaque reads, Freeholder, the third annual Gracious Crowns Award given by the Edison Art Society to honor public or civic groups that enhance the quality of life through their attention to beauty, through planting and landscaping. And I present this award, this plaque, to the to a freeholder, Delina, on behalf of the Art Society, for everyone who sits on the Board of Chosen Freeholders. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I'm just going to say a few words. I really am shocked when they told me I'm getting a plaque. I said, there's something behind us. But Angelo's a good friend of mine. And anytime he needs help in Edison, he knows where to come. And like I say, it's really, I really am happy to get this plaque, and I can't tell you enough, I'm, I'm speechless. Thank you, and God bless all of you. Thank you, thank you so much, Freeholder. Uh, you've done a great job, and you continue to do a great job. I must mention uh, for just a second, in fact, more than just a second, an individual or two individuals who work so closely with myself and my executive director. One is Margaret Pemberton, the greatest county clerk in the world, okay? And uh, yes, please. And secondly, without a doubt, the greatest park supervisor in the world, Ralph Albanier. Is Ralph here someplace? Ralph, stand up, okay? Let me see who you are. Ralph, thank you so much. So once again, uh, we thank you for having uh, spent a few minutes with you tonight. We thank you for your presence and support, and we thank you for many years of your future support. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm not going to kick you. I know. Well, listen, I know you know where my phone number is. I'm going to get a new number. You're not going to get it, though. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Freeholder H. James Pauls. Thank you, Freeholder Director. Um, a few items this evening. First, um, I wanted to just mention to uh, Mr. Jack from the George Street Playhouse, over the last few years, the county has um, had a great working relationship with the Playhouse when it came to educational opportunities, in particular the two programs that, that fall under my area of responsibility, the 3D public service announcement uh, video contest, uh, where we try to use our high school students to develop their own 30-second public service announcement videos about the dangers of drinking and driving. And most recently, we received a $10,000 grant to have students develop a 30-second public service announcement about clean energy. And in both instances, we um, uh, employed the great services of the George Street Playhouse, uh, both on a voluntary basis. They came and they did some workshops. And then more recently, we kind of used them in a management capacity for the second grant. So uh, I, you, the reach of the George Street Playhouse goes well beyond just the artistic value. And we appreciate the efforts of uh, the Playhouse when it comes to those types of events. Uh, this past week, uh, or two weeks ago, I should say, obviously it was the Middlesex County Fair. I would just like to publicly commend uh, all of the members of our staff 
who uh, collectively, I'm sure I speak for all the freeholders, who participated in that event. Uh, it is a great event each year. It brings a lot of people out, and particularly Yeoman's job and my departments for what they did and be able to provide information to the residents who come out there, not only to have fun and recreate, but to learn a little bit more about what Middlesex County is all, all about. I'm glad to see Mayor Rosigliano here this evening because a little update on our Highway Traffic Safety Grant Program, which Edison is a very important part of. Um, we had a second meeting and uh, are discussing now in um, small workshop groups some of the particular areas that we're focusing on when it comes to pedestrian safety and driver safety mm -hmm. training. Uh, we had our first meeting of our older adult traffic safety committee, very exciting group and uh, very interested in providing more information about how we can make our streets safer, particularly for our elder population, many of whom are walking and driving and just feel as though there can be improvements made. Uh, we kind of call it really the, the, there are three E's, so to speak, as we see it. There's the education, uh, the enforcement, and the enhancements that we need to think about. Uh, education clearly, enforcement is clear, enhancements meaning those improvements that we can make structurally, um, physically to intersections and roadways, signage, lighting, striping, et cetera, that can make uh, it safer for our motoring public as well as for those who are walking on our streets. Uh, two weeks ago, I had the pleasure of participating in the uh, National Night Out. We uh, ran a program through our, again, I'm going to thank our Public Works Department. We provided our golf cart program. That's where we use uh, golf carts with local police to simulate what it would be like to try to drive intoxicated. It's been a very successful program for the last uh, nine years. And we actually ran two programs that night, one at the National Night Out in North Brunswick and one in Highland Park. Very well received. And again, thank you to our department for putting out that program. Um, the South County Public Safety Dispatch Initiative is moving along very well. We have another meeting coming up in another uh, couple of weeks to finalize some details with the participants in that program. And again, it's a great opportunity for communities to work together to share public safety dispatch, reduce costs, be more efficient, and reduce the burden on the local taxpayer. In the same vein, uh, I just spoke with our engineer uh, last week who is putting together the design uh, scenarios for the new county car wash. This, again, is a joint partnership between Middlesex County and several area communities. The goal of this new facility would be to meet the new stormwater regulations that are required by the Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, the nice thing about this initiative is, is it shares services and puts uh, resources together from several communities as well as the county to build one facility as opposed to each individual town building their own. It's much more cost effective, uh, again, reduces the burden not only on the county taxpayer but the local taxpayer as well, helps us achieve the necessary regulatory requirements uh, and is a very efficient way to create a new partnership. So we're excited that that's moving ahead and we have several scenarios that we're going to be discussing in our next meeting which will be coming up as soon as the summer ends. On the agenda tonight is uh, Resolution 1344 to hire the Skylands Renewable Energy Company. Uh, it is uh, only $1,000, but it is for a wind assessment and a site assessment. Uh, we are looking now at trying to do a demonstration project for a wind turbine at one of our park facilities in uh, Old Bridge, which is along the uh, bay. This would be the first of its uh, type in Middlesex County. Uh, again, it's the purpose behind it is to create a demonstration project which falls in line with the mission statement of the Middlesex County Showroom of Environmental Technology, which we began a number of years ago, where the county is taking the lead and has in the past as well on trying to develop um, the new green technologies in our county so that local municipalities, businesses, uh, residents can understand, see, feel, and touch the technology and understand whether or not it can work for them. We have a very successful solar project at our Cooperative Extension Services building, which I believe uh, a few years ago stimulated many communities now who are now putting in solar, and we certainly are glad to see that happen. Uh, perhaps this um, new endeavor into wind technology and the efficiencies that it can create may also create some new opportunities, not only for the government side and school side, but for the private sector as well. So we're hopeful that that will uh, come to fruition at some time in the near future. Uh, thank you very much, Director. Thanks. Deputy Director Ron Rios. Thank you, Director. As far as my health report goes, our county health department and the, and the county cancer coalition participated in Choose Your Cover, a statewide skin cancer screening awareness and educational initiative on July 17, uh, 2010. And it's about encouraging people to make sure they take care of their skin, especially during summer. I, uh, I've always been a, a sun worshiper, but as I got older, I got 
a little wiser and I try to uh, protect myself and it's important that everyone protects themselves from uh, uh, sun damage because you hear so many people getting uh, skin cancer and there were some people that were uh, screened and, uh, and some were uh, referred for biopsies. So it's important that we uh, stress that. August is National Immunization Awareness Month and it's a good time for county residents of all ages to keep up on their immunizations because immunizations uh, give you a, a healthier life, longer life, especially for babies, right to seniors. So it's important that you uh, see your health care provider and keep up to date on that. Tonight, the uh, health department will be accepting uh, over $950,000 in grants for various uh, programs that we have in the health department. As far as my uh, report for Ratton Bay Mental Health Service, uh, we are in the final phase of renovating the building over there, the lobby, which is giving us more added space. And we were able to do that with the uh, personnel from public property. And it just shows you how different departments can work together and uh, get a bigger bang for our buck when we're doing things uh, in-house. As far as uh, Middlesex County College and the vocational school, we're both getting ready for uh, sept September opening of school. And as far as my um, uh, Rutgers Extension uh, report, the fair was a success. Uh, a lot of people participated in the, in the fair. It was really nice. We uh, had good weather. Uh, I always enjoy going there and uh, eating a lot of the homemade foods and uh, buying a lot of the vegetables from our, our own uh, farmers. And uh, the Rutgers Extension Service donated thousands of produce to an Elijah's Promise that was produce that was grown right at the Earth Center. And that concludes my report, Director. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Re Director. Freeholder Blanquita Valente. Uh, thank you, Freeholder Director. I just want to commend the Board of Freeholders for naming uh, such a fine group of uh, ladies to the uh, Commission on the Status of Women and, of course, recreating that particular commission, which I, I know has been kind of quiet for a while, but will be back in full force. And I just want to mention that um, National Night Out in New Brunswick was quite a busy place. We made, uh, in a caravan fashion with the police and other citizens uh, and government officials, we stopped at 14 uh, neighborhoods that were celebrating National Night Out, and it was quite a successful event. And that's the end of my report. I'm going to shock you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Freelder. I have a couple quick items. I received a copy of the 2009 County Audit Report, <coughs> which is where they audit um, our books, for lack of a better word at this point. And it has in it a statement that says there is no need for a corrective action plan. So that's good news. Al Kachinka, he stepped out a second, but good news for Middlesex County. Once again, uh, no need for a corrective action plan. Uh, I have a statement um, that I'd like to read. Uh, Freeholder Scott had asked me to read it. Uh, as you know, she's chair of law and public safety. She's on a, a well-deserved vacation right now and has asked me to read a short statement. Um, and it concerns resolution 10-13-29 on tonight's agenda, which would authorize the approval on first reading of an ordinance that would provide for county enforcement of the New Jersey Uniform Fire Safety Code. It also would appoint the Minnesota County Fire Marshal's Office as the county fire official responsible for enforcing the New Jersey Uniform Fire Safety Act on behalf of the county and any municipality who wishes to contract with us for this service. I urge my fellow freeholders to support this resolution because this is a perfect example of a shared service and of a way to consolidate certain services at the county level. Right now, each of our towns has their own fire official. If this ordinance is approved and if towns decide to contract with us for this service, they would save money by not having to hire staff for these duties. Regionalizing this service at the county level will provide immediate cost savings to the municipalities that join the effort and ultimately lead to a reduction in property taxes for our residents. Fire Marshal Mike Gallagher, Shared Services Coordinator Mark Boiler, and Millie Scott met with representatives from Middlesex Borough, Milltown, South Brunswick, and Spotswood on June 2nd. All parties were interested in this program. Donnellan also has shown interest. We welcome any other municipalities who may want to use the county fire marshal's office as the local code enforcer. If this ordinance is approved on first reading tonight, a public hearing and possible adoption will be held on October 
at our October 7th meeting. Thank you. So that, that's certainly good news and a perfect example of shared services on a county level to save tax dollars. Okay. We need to deviate from our regular order of business for four ordinances, I believe. Yes. Mr. Kelso? Uh, yes, just very briefly, uh, you'll note that there is a slight change in the ordinance numbering sequence. Uh, that's a change from Monday night's agenda. There was just a slight change in order to keep them uh, consistently in order from previous ordinances. Okay. The clerk will read ordinance number 10-02 by title only. An ordinance authorizing the guarantee by the County of Middlesex, State of New Jersey, of the payment of principal of and interest on the county guaranteed capital equipment and improvement revenue bonds, series 2010, issued by the Middlesex County Improvement Authority in an aggregate principal amount not to exceed $22 million, and authorizing a public hearing to be held Thursday, September 2nd, 2010, at 7 p.m., and authorizing publication thereof. I need a motion to adopt ordinance number 10-02 on first reading. So moved. Second. Motion by Deputy Director Rio, seconded by Freeholder Valente. Roll <coughs> call. Freeholder Delina. Yes. Freeholder Polos. Yes. Freeholder Rios. Yes. Freeholder Valenti? Yes. Freeholder Director Rafano? Yes. Clerk will read ordinance number 10-03 by title only. An ordinance of the County of Middlesex, State of New Jersey, approving, approving and authorizing the entering into execution and delivery of a lease and agreement with the Middlesex County Improvement Authority for the purchase of vehicles with an estimated cost of $910,400 the cost of such vehicles to be financed through the issuance of county guaranteed capital equipment and improvement revenue bonds series 2010 of the Middlesex County Improvement Authority and authorizing a public hearing to be held Thursday, September 2nd, 2010 at 7 p.m. and authorizing publication thereof. I need a motion to adopt ordinance number 10-03 on first reading. Second. Motion by Deputy Director Rio, seconded by Freeholder Valente. Roll call. Freeholder Delina? Yep. Freeholder Polos? Yes. Freeholder Rios? Yes. Freeholder Valenti? Yes. Freeholder Director Rafano? Yes. <laughs> Clerk will read ordinance number 391 by title only. A loan ordinance of the County of Middlesex, State of New Jersey, approving and authorizing the entering into execution and delivery of a loan and security agreement with the Middlesex County Improvement Authority for the undertaking of areas 2010 capital improvements and the acquisition and installation as applicable of various equipment with an estimated cost of $13,037,453, the cost of such improvements and equipment to be financed through the issuance of county guaranteed capital equipment and improvement revenue bonds, series 2010 of the Middlesex County Improvement Authority, and authorizing a public hearing to be held Thursday, September 2nd, 2010 at 7 p.m., and authorizing publication thereof. I need a motion to adopt ordinance number 391 on first reading. Motion. Second. Motion by Deputy Director Rios, seconded by Freeholder Valente. Roll call. Freeholder Delina? Yes. Freeholder Polos? Yes. Freeholder Rios? Yes. Freeholder Valente? Yes. Freeholder Director Rafano? Yes. The clerk will read ordinance number 10 1329 by title only. Authorize approval upon first reading of county ordinance providing for county enforcement of the New Jersey Uniform Fire Safety Act, NJSA 52 27D 192 at SEC, and the New Jersey Uniform Fire Code, NJAC 5 70 at SEC, and appointing the Middlesex County Fire Marshal as the county fire official, authorized public hearing to be held on Thursday, October 7, 2010, at 7 p.m. in the Freeholders Meeting Room. I need a motion to adopt Ordinance Number 10 1329 on first reading. So moved. Second. Motion by Deputy Director Rios, seconded by Freeholder Valente. Roll call. Freeholder Delena? Yes. Freeholder Polos? Yes. Freeholder Rios? Yes. Freeholder Valente? Yes. Freeholder Director Rafano? Yes. Need a motion to resume the regular order of business? So moved. Second. Motion by Deputy Director Rios, seconded by Freeholder Valente. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Ayes have it. Okay, Mr. Kelso, you're on. Any resolutions to be amended? Yes, we have one resolution to be amended, uh, Resolution 10-1319, which is the personnel report. Uh, the amendment uh, is uh, before you on the dais. Uh, it's just indicating the one individual uh, who has declined a position for a full-time job offer, which was identified as a hire on your report. I need a motion to amend? Yes. So moved. Second. Motion by Deputy Director Rio, seconded by Freeholder Valente. Roll call. Freeholder Delina? 
Yes. Freeholder Polos? Yes. Freeholder Rios? Yes. Freeholder Valenti? Yes. Freeholder Director Rafano? Yes. Any resolutions to be added? There are none. Resolutions to be held? Yes, we have two resolutions to be held. Uh, the first is 10 1356, which was identified Monday evening on page 9, and also resolution 10 1463 on page 19. Uh, no action is necessary uh, to hold them. Okay. Any resolutions to be voided? Yes, we have one resolution on page 21, that's 10 1483, as identified our agenda meeting Monday evening, uh, the conference that's involved in that is canceled. Okay. At this point in time, I'd like to open the meeting up to the public for discussion on resolutions listed on the agenda. Mr. Stewart. Richard Stewart, New Brunswick. Remember, there's a five minute rule, Mr. Stewart. Pardon? Remember, there's a five minute rule. Five minutes? Yeah. That's for other people. <laughs> Page two. Uh, I, uh, I want to say uh, I was saved quite a bit of time here. On 1283, that's that payment to the George Street because I had marked that to ask about it. I only have one question left with respect to that. Does that 24,000, when they have programs at the George Street or at the uh, uh, theater, and they have all the school buses there. Somebody's paying for all those school buses. Kids. Does that come out of this 24? It's what are you talking about theater? About the place no. in the park? No, 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 Stewart, no, no. That does not come out of the 24. No. no. They have separate funding for that. No. But the, 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 kids, school, the schools, schools do. The schools pay for it. School pays for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, page five. On the personnel report, um, 1319, um, I confess I have had to miss a few of the meetings, so maybe this was mentioned. I'm seeing in the personnel report um, layoffs. Uh, how did that come to pass? What was the reason? Dennis? Uh, Mr. Stewart, um, due to funding that was cut from state um, for a specific grant within the health department, created some uh, layoffs due to the civil service and the bumping rights. Uh, we lost some grant funding, and those employees had been working in that grant for several years, so there was really no money to fund the program. And there was an additional cut uh, through Raritan Bay Mental Health, uh, where the funding was also cut there. Uh, one other thing, I don't know whether I've asked this before or not. Uh, I always come back to the uh, veterans uh, or the servicemen question. Do we, some companies make up the difference between the salary, service salary, and their civilian salary? Does the county do that or not? Yes, they, we have a program that they put in. We, based on what they, military leave salary is. Um, quite often it's, it's higher than their salary here as an employee. Um, it doesn't really have that much effect on us, but if it is lower, we do make the difference up. Excellent. Uh, page six. Um, number 1332, the uh, steam tables for the senior services. Is that where the uh, county senior meal are provided? Yes. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it doesn't say where in on this, but uh, I presume it varies around with those different, sites. Different locations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in the public? Good evening. Good evening. My name is Marianne Overlees. I'm from Piscataway, New Jersey. 
I'd like to make a comment uh, about the proposed easeways that are going to be put onto South Washington Avenue uh, that will kind of start the beginning of the new Piscataway Business Center. Um, myself and maybe a handful of people, including my friend Ed here, we've been here on the beginning. We're not happy about this. We've gone to all the meetings and we're trying to do, I don't have a litany of lawyers and all kinds of experts and I'm not very good on the computer so I only have a little bit of information. But this is wrong. What's happening on this track of land, we need these small pockets of wetland. Once a warehouse goes on top of this wetlands, everything is going to change the entire area. Now we got two warehouses and adjacent um, office building that are gonna go on this. Well, I'm sure by now, because all my neighbors and everybody else are telling me that I'm wasting my time. It's my time to waste. If we actually have to go through something like this, this better be the greenest place that could actually be in Piscataway. Because these easements, and from what I understand, and when I sat through all these meetings, they didn't seem like they're gonna protect our water very much. It doesn't seem like any of the wetlands in the wetland area that this is, is really going to be protected. If you drive down South Washington right now, that breaks your heart just by seeing what's going on now. And just from what we're doing on the road, impact what's going on behind that, including all the streams, all the small little courses that all end up going from where they plan to build all the way back behind, even to my house, to the runoff that goes right back by Lake Nelson and then goes all over town. Uh, last year, it only took me four days to come up with, and I know it's not legal, I understand that, that wasn't the idea of why we did it. Why we did it was there's a sum of 100 and odd people just from my neighborhood in a span of four days who said, this is not a good thing and I'd like to be here, but I can't. So here's my signature. Uh, if you guys have been noticing in the papers lately, everything is decades of New Jersey sprawl, wetland. And this is just this month. We've got to protect these small areas. And the way they're building Piscataway up now, there's not gonna be anything left. There's gonna be no water protection. Right now, from what I understand, the arbor section of Piscataway, they have tainted well water because of the businesses around where you should not have these businesses in the first place. Back then, we didn't know that. You know, nobody knew that this was, we know now, and I don't have to stand here and quote all kinds of stuff. That's what my friend Ed is gonna do. And most of us know the damage that some of these places can do. Please, before you make your vote, I'm asking you even if you can hold off to get different opinions. Bob uh, Spiegel from uh, Edison Wetlands already knows of a lot of problems that have already happened with the same kind of uh, 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 contraption that they want to put on this uh, property. I would like to see you, I mean, I'm, I know we're gonna have a barrage of lawyers and they can say this and that. All I'm asking is take a little extra time, you've already gone through a year as it is, and you've waited for them to give them more information. Let's get some different kind of experts in and double check where they're actually gonna put this because it's beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous back there. There's nothing but a big, fat, beautiful lake and what's not gonna be trees. There's not gonna be the deer. There's not gonna be the, the fox, all the other beautiful things that are back in that tiny little piece of land that they wanna This is just one small area. This gives you a better overview. It's two pictures put together. Time. 
And if you'd like, I'd be very happy to, your, your most wonderful clerkage could hang on and I'd be very honored if you'd see my quote unquote diary. I'll keep the petition so the Sioux people don't get upset. <laughs> but I would be honored if you would like to peruse some of the things that have gone on in the neighborhood. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Ed Marsh from Wyckoff Avenue in Piscataway. I'm the Ed she's been referring to. I'd also like to say a few words about the proposed diversion of Green Acres in the Ambrose and Doty's Brook Park in Piscataway. Resolution number 10-1281. As a concerned and conservation-minded citizen, I'm opposed to the easement and diversion. The easement and diversion set a bad precedent for open space by allowing it to be diverted from public use and conservation for development purposes. The diversion would allow construction of a stormwater conveyance pipe from an adjacent property slated for construction of two large warehouse buildings called the Piscataway Business Center. The warehouses and their parking lots would cover most of the adjacent property with impervious surfaces, which will prevent raindrops from soaking into the ground and instead which will generate storm runoff. This runoff would be directed into several stormwater basins at the site which would overflow into the conveyance pipe and into the Ambrose and Doty's Brook inside the park. According to the engineer who answered questions at the public hearing, this conveyance pipe would spew 120 cubic feet of stormwater per second into the Ambrose and Doty's Brook during peak storms. I believe that is enough water to cover a football field with a foot of water every eight minutes. Although the amount of land taken for the diversion and easement is small, they could have an adverse impact by, number one, increasing storm runoff and downstream flooding in the park and on area roads, number two, impairing water quality, number three, increasing, increasing erosion and scouring of the stream bank, and number four, encroaching upon a stream corridor buffer and its ecosystem. Stream corridors provide important ecological functions which include absorbing and storing floodwaters, improving water quality, providing areas for passive recreation and environmental education, and in urban areas, stream corridors are often the only place left for threatened species of wildlife. <clears throat> the Ambrose and Doty's Brook Park and Corridor is home to many species of wildlife, including turtles, frogs, fish, herons, ducks, hawks, deer, and wild turkey. The ecosystem of the Ambrose and Doty's Brook is already compromised by the vast amount of development in its watershed, especially along Stelton Road. The diversion would also facilitate construction of the poorly planned Piscataway Business Center, which does not conform to the zoning and environmental restrictions at the site and which is not consistent with the model ordinance for stream corridor protection. The business center could also increase traffic congestion on nearby Interstate 287, Stelton Road, Centennial Ave, and a residential residential section of Mettler's Lane. The related widening of South Washington Ave will also increase storm runoff and could encourage speeding on the roadway and decrease safety. The potential benefits that the diversion and business center could bring to Piscataway are outweighed by the overall negative impact on the community. I urge you, our elected representatives, who care about protecting our community and parks and the Raritan watershed, to reject this easement. I have a couple more words. As you should know, dozens of, I and dozens of other Piscataway residents have signed petitions or spoken up or stood up in opposition at the public hearing to the Green Acres diversion in the park. Bob Spiegel, director of Edison Wetlands Association, has also gone on record in opposition to the diversion. I'd now like to make a copy of the statement that I've just read, a part of the official record. Thank you. Uh, I'm Rob Stevenson. I live at 7-11 Green Street, apartment 1A in Metuchen. Um, I'd just like to say, you know, I think you guys are making a big mistake by letting this go through. Um, where's all the water going to go? 
Eventually it goes into Doty's Brook or Ambrose Brook, eventually into the Raritan River. Bound Brook is underwater every five years. Main Street is flooded. There's no place for the water to go. And I have a lot of respect for Mayor Waller. However, you know, I think he's wrong by putting this through. He objected when that TD bank was put at the corner of Mettler's Lane and Stilton Road. He objected about that. He was mad at the Halpers for selling the land. He was all upset about that. And now he's putting in two huge warehouses on 47 acres of land. And they're just, you know, you guys got to think about 10 or 20 years down the road. You know, there's no place for the water to go. Flooding is just going to increase. And, uh, you know, in the long run, it's going to be a big mistake. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I really ask you to reconsider all the, the ramifications of uh, encroaching on wetlands and what's supposed to be parklands and so on. I, I, you know, I, I think if you look like 10, 20 years down the road, you're going to make a big mistake and there's just going to be more flooding, more problems, more traffic, more urbanization. And, um, you know, I, I want to want to go on the record as opposing this. Good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Dane Montesano. I'm from Biscataway as well. Um, I have a few questions in a different area, but before I get going on those questions, um, I, I kind of agree with them on overdevelopment. Um, I think we need to move towards smart growth tech, you know, growth where you balance it out, save some open space for future generations. Do you guys look at that at all or, or, or think you're going to bring that into the county development plan at all? Or? What, open space? Uh, smart growth tech, you know, uh, strategy where you're balancing the growth. I mean, everything has to grow. You have to expand, um, but you have to balance it instead of expanding all at one time. You know, I, I think the county definitely has a very, very effective open space preservation program. We preserve thousands and thousands of acres um, over the years. Okay, but in certain areas, in certain areas, no, right? Um, where smart growth is kind of like bounces out amongst every single area in the town to look at the overall big picture instead of just little areas. There's certainly uh, some areas of the county, like the southern part of the county where there's more open space, it's easier to preserve more open space because it's not built up. But when you go to some of your, for example, maybe the city of New Brunswick or Perth Amboy, they're already built up, so it's tough to preserve open space in those particular areas. But we, we rest assured we are preserving open space on an aggressive basis. Well, I mentioned smart growth because uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Kim Giordano had moved that um, smart growth office, you know, into her office. And mm -hmm. um, looks like the state may be moving that direction. You got me want to coordinate on that. Uh, but beyond that, what I'm really here for is um, on the help perform financing between Piscataway and the county, is that finalized? Are you asking a question on a specific resolution on the agenda? Because I don't believe there's anything on this agenda that has to do with uh, the open space acquisition for Halper. Well, no, there isn't on the agenda. I'm asking uh, basically a question because of the road construction on South Washington Ave. Best way to answer, uh, I think what your question is, is the county has acquired the property. And the, the financing and pay final payment for the settlement of the acquisition has been completed. It has been completed? Okay, so the helpers have got our money in the town. In the town and the county had kind of made a deal for the extra easement? Well, the final payment was a combination of funding from both the county and the Township of Piscataway. Okay. Um, now, um, so basically then that inquires uh, the... Um, the land on both sides of South Washington Ave um, that was acquired, or is it just one side? That particular acquisition was one side. Was the Halpers Farm side? Correct. Okay. Um, and, and the other thing I'm, I'm curious about, because the uh, road construction moved really fast, um, I see Belgian block and sidewalks, and it's just not a residential area. I mean, I don't understand. Where's the foot traffic coming from? Why is the sidewalks being that's built? That's, that's a local issue. Isn't that a county project? No. I, I can't answer the Belgian block question. I don't even know what the question is. It's a county project. I'm sure it is. Traditionally, the town uh, takes the sidewalks. That's the question you're asking? 
Well, it, not taking care of it. I'm just wondering why on South Washington Ave. If you have a county project and it's a county road and they want to put sidewalks, they have to pay for it. Oh, the town pays for that. So that's not part of the county project that was. It could be part of the county project, but not part of the county code. Okay, so Piscataway is paying for those sidewalks and, those, and that curbing. Totally. <laughs> that's interesting. Okay. Um, and, you know, the, the other thing I'm curious too is. Um, now, I went to the county to, to get plans that were supposed to be done for the open space. They told me, I, and I had to jump through hoops. I mean, I had to go through a lot of hoops. And it, was, it was unbelievable the amount of time I had to get involved on this. They said, well, it's Piscataway property. You have to go to Piscataway. Now, Piscataway hands me these plans. It looks like a cartoon. Well, it is an arrow shot with different color markers marking certain areas. I mean, you call that a plan? I don't know what's going on. I mean, is there a, something I'm doing wrong here, not getting the real plans of what's going on with that property? How can I go about getting the real plans for that property? Is it before the planning what board there? What no, well, I use the... Only, I think you, you, I'm just trying to say to you, I think the next step, if Piscataway goes into the project, they're going to have to go to the planning board with plans to show them what they're going to do. So you could go there and look at it and see what you want to say if it's you're against it or if you're not against it. But the planning board, I don't know if they have the plan or not. Do they have the plan, John? I, I'm not sure. Are you talking about a park or are you talking about a, a site plan? Well, I, 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 use the, I use the Open Public Records Act to, to get the plans in review, the plans that are, are being considered. Or a site plan or for a public park? For, for, and for the park. I put it all on that Oprah Act with the tax ID numbers and everything. Well, I mean, the township itself, um, all it is is an aerial shot, you know, with... Uh, time's up, sir. I'm sorry. You know. All right. Well, thank you for your time. Another gentleman. Sure. Good evening, for your holders. My name is James Birdsall. I reside at 84 Woodland Road in Piscataway, New Jersey, right behind the area we're in discussion. My parents moved to the River Road area of Piscataway in 1939. I spent my first 21 years of my life as a resident of Piscataway. When I was 21, I joined the Armed Forces of the United States of America. I moved back to this beautiful Lake Delson area in Piscataway in January of 2007. Now, I'm not, I know, as the gentleman said, progress has to be made, but it should be made in a reasonable, reasonable sense because we do need wetlands. As a matter of fact, the whole discussion of the Highlands Park in New Jersey is all wetlands preservation and watershed. And I also have a well, so I'm concerned about any runoff there. Or am I going to be guaranteed that I, I will be given free water by the developer in the event my well is tainted? Because this, this, would, this, this would affect my quality of life where I live as a retired veteran, senior citizen, person who's disabled, I'm very concerned about about infringements on the only thing I have in my life here. Thank you very much. Good evening, guys. Uh, Jordan Rickers, North Brunswick. I just have a quick question. You got about 200 items on the consent agenda tonight. Does that sound right? Just roughly. Uh, I just subtracted 1488 from 1277. All right. Good. All right. Just real quick. What's the total cost? Of what? of what you're about to vote on, the consent agenda. What's the cost? I think the information's on each item on the resolution. Yeah, I know, but I can see that. But what's the total cost? I mean, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna buy a house, I don't wanna know how much the chair costs in this room or the towel in that room. I want the, the total cost. I'm just asking, what's, the, you're about to cast, five of you are gonna vote on, on 200 resolutions, 1,000 votes. Just wanna know what the cost is, that's all. Is, and if the answer is you don't know the cost, that's fine. I'm, that's all I'm asking. We don't know the total cost, we know the individual cost. All right, well, would you consider you know, postponing a vote till you've actually determined how much this next vote's gonna cost us? I think the best way to, to respond to you, I think, first of all, you should identify yourself as a candidate for public office. I'm a candidate for public office. Okay. A Republican. A freeholder. That's right. On a Republican ticket. Okay. That's right. Nice to meet you. Every resolution and every funding uh, position on each resolution is reviewed by the controller's office to determine whether or not that resolution is funded pursuant to the budget 
that this freeholder board has already approved. I understand. So all that all that the freeholders will review individually and, and collectively is whether or not it conforms with the budget, which they went through a completely exhaustive budget process earlier in the year to determine whether or not everything that they're going to vote on is in line with that budget. Right. There's no need, there's no legal basis, nor, nor an action necessary to add it up each time you take a vote pursuant to the budget. So I think you're, ask, you're asking an argumentative question because you yourself could add it up if, you, if you'd like to, but there is no statutory need nor budgetary need to add it up for each meeting as you're taking an action pursuant to the budget. Well, certainly my purpose isn't to be argumentative. I'll save that for you know, next month. But um, you know, I have a budget too in my own finances, and that doesn't stop me from determining how much money I'm going to spend. I still want to know how much things cost. And look, uh, lest I be accused of being argumentative again, I know that you and I are both attorneys, and so that's what we do. But um, you know, if the answer is you don't know how much it costs, that's fine. That's the answer. You can say we that. We do know how much it costs, and we know each individual resolution that's here. It's up for a vote. We have it for review prior to the meeting, and we have the right to review each resolution. And every every governing body does this the same way. Well, maybe that should I change. This is not a new policy. I, no, I know it's not new. I know, but maybe it's time for a new policy. You know, it would be a good I, I idea. The, the only thing that I would, would ask you, though, and as counsel to the board, perhaps there's a, a rationale that you're giving to us that may make sense. Okay. What would be the reason why at any particular meeting that you would need to know the, to the total of expenditures that are voted on if each one of those expenditures is in line with the budget that's already approved? So, well, that, for example, in the month of August, which we're in, we have one meeting where action is taken on resolutions. In every other month, there's two meetings. So by the, by the nature of the month of August, and you can see this agenda is large, there's more action items this month at one meeting than it would be at any other month. I understand. The point is, it's not really relevant, the question that you're asking, as to what is the total that we're, that we're committing to at this particular meeting, so long as it's in line with the budget. If there's a rationale that you think is important, tell us what it is, because the, the, the freeholders could take it into consideration. There doesn't seem to be any that jumps out at me as to the relevance of a total at a particular meeting. You're asking me my, my rationale? Yeah. And then which one of us is really being argumentative? No. I asked you for purposes, as I said, as to maybe there's, there's a good rationale. The rationale is as a consider. taxpayer, I want to know how much money is about to be spent in the next five minutes. And I see your point. There's no point in us, you know, buttonheads. I've made my point. You've made yours. Let me just put you on notice. On September 2nd, I'm going to be here again. I'm going to ask very simple questions. My questions are going to be how many acres of open space do we have? And I'm going to see if you guys know the assessed value, seeing as it is the largest county asset, and any corporation in America would know what the, large, what the value of their largest asset is. And I think that's going to be a very fair question, and you guys are on notice for it. Is that all right? Let me make sure I understand that. You, you're going to want to know the assessed value, the current assessed value right. of all of the lands that the county owns Through open for space. open space purposes. Right. Do you want to know the lands, the assessment of lands that the county has funded, but funded through the municipality so that the municipalities I want to know the total value lands? of the asset. Do you want to know the total value of assets where the county has taken uh, conservation easement time but don't have the ownership rights to those properties but rather have easement rights well, I just I'm want to make sure we know what the question is you're asking so that you say we didn't answer it at the next meeting well then lest you be accused of not answering the question perhaps you could answer both of them at the next meeting we could have a comprehensive discussion about it okay and to the extent that the county when it owns properties and the townships and the municipalities when they own properties are tax exempt is there a relevance to your question with respect to what the assessment is? Is my time expired? Yes, it has. Oh, I'm asking you a question. It's fair for you to answer that. And, and you're asking why I want to know what our largest asset is? Because we keep buying more of it, and I want to know what the total value is. Maybe, here's a wild thought, maybe there might come a point where we might divest ourselves of some asset in order to, to defer costs. I don't know, because I don't know what the total assessed value is yet. I don't know how many we have. I'm just putting you on notice. On September 2nd, I might be here. I might ask that question. And I think you agree it's a fair question. That's all. Didn't mean to. That's fine. Okay. Have a nice evening, everyone. Anybody else in the public? How you doing? Uh, Robert Bostic, Piscataway. I am also a candidate for a council in Piscataway. And I'm here on behalf of a few of the folks. Actually, follow-up questions in regards to 
questions that they had asked earlier. First of all, specific to the plans for County Road Improvement, Washington Avenue, um, where can those plans be obtained? John. We have in the county engineer's office. Okay, thank you. Um, how much property did the county acquire for the road improvements? You, we'd have to look at the plans. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head uh, how many uh, parcels or how many acres. Okay, and do we know what Piscataway got from the county? Everything's in the plans. You okay. very detailed plans. Okay, thank you. And just one follow up on. 10 1281 which was addressed earlier on the warehouse construction um, specific to that construction project there's a retention ditch that was put on the farm side of the road a number of residents have called me concerned about runoff um, from that retention ditch into Lake Nelson which is a privately owned lake very near that property and they have very serious environmental concerns um, my question is, has there been an environmental study on the effects of Lake Nelson? Uh, there's been no study on Lake Nelson. Okay, and to follow up, I know the association that owns the lake has reached out to the engineers and there's been no contact, so I would like to go on record that the engineers do need to contact the Lake Nelson Homeowners Association. They're very concerned about their lake. Just for the record, I did receive a letter dated August 16th, and I have it with me, and I've given it to the county administrator, and I'll give it to the engineer, too, from the Lake Nelson Improvement Association. Okay, thank you. Field Director, I have a question. Sure. Maybe for county council. Could you walk us through what the process is if we were to agree to do this final application mm -hmm. tonight? What are, the, what are the next steps that occur when we come back to the board? Because I think interesting questions have been raised. We need to get answers on well, some we, of the questions that have been raised that we have not been provided in the past, and I'd like to make sure we have that opportunity before we do anything that's final. If, for, first of all, just so we understand, the resolution that's on this evening is to authorize the submission of an application to the DEP Green Acres Program for diversion of the 0.2 acres, which is located in, in lands that are currently green acres restricted. And as you know, in order for those lands to be released, the green acres program has to agree to the diversion and the responsibilities associated with that. The project that's being referred to is not jurisdictionally one that this board had any review over. It was a local land use application in the township of Piscataway, which was approved by their local land use board. I'm, I'm not sure if it was the planning board or the zoning board. Uh, as part of that application and the approvals, there was a request made in order to allow stormwater <coughs> management facilities to be located within areas that were green acre restricted that would cause this outflow structure to allow waters, uh, stormwater runoff to be diverted into that structure which ultimately ended up in the Ambrose Doty Brook. Brook. Ambrose Doty Brook. Um, No, it, right. The outfall structure is just the outfall and the pipe underground. Correct. Is deep into that area and runs for 360 feet. Right. The the process is one where the county is not approving the diversion. It's the state DEP that approves the diversion. The application, however, has to come through the county because county lands are affected, and the county the diversion of that 2.2 acres. Is, is has to be approved by us before the DEP would review it. The ultimate review of whether or not the diversion is appropriate is the DEP's. The DEP reviews it for Green Acres purposes because of the restrictions, but also the DEP has to review it from their stormwater management de department as part of a regular land use application. And as I understand it, particularly now with the regulations associated with with uh, water quality controls, the, the stormwater runoff, which will now come through that structure into the brook, actually is better water quality because there are now water quality controls which will be placed on that water stormwater management. And I know that there are engineering studies that have been done by the applicant, engineering studies that have been reviewed by the county engineer's department, all of which form part of the application that goes to the DEP. 
we're not actually approving this evening by this resolution the, the construction of that facility. We're simply approving the submission of that application to the DEP for their review. In the end, if the DEP is not satisfied, either with the stormwater management controls and the water quality that ultimately comes through that structure, or they're not satisfied with the actual diversion of the 0.2 acres because of where it's located or how it relates to the balance of the green acre restricted property, then they would deny the application. But the ultimate approval or denial is the DEP. And could you remind me, it's been some time, what was the reason why this had to be done and it couldn't just be handled on the, on the property itself? Uh, I don't know the detail of that. I do know that, that as part of the process, the, the stormwater management applica application, it was the logical location for it. That's the best way that I can describe it. I know that the applicant is actually has their engineer here this evening. If That might be a question that uh, could be directed to that engineer. Okay. Ralph, maybe you. Good evening. My name is Mark Janizewski. I work for the firm Mazer Consulting, and I am the engineer that has designed the Piscataway Business Project. To answer that question, the, all the stormwater management facilities that treat the stormwater for the project are on the actual property owned by the applicant. And as was stated earlier, just the conveyance pipe is what will be on the park property, which constitutes the 0 0.2 acres. The reason for having to go onto the park property is essentially sound engineering, sound engineering practices to prevent uh, erosion of the park itself. Uh, stormwater currently runs off the site into the brook, and the pipe is necessary to convey it safely down to the brook. Otherwise, there'd be erosion along the banks of the brook. But there are, are there not, water quality controls that now by regulation treats that stormwater such that the water that ends up going into the brook through that structure is, is now of a higher quality, is it not, than what would be surface runoff from the existing? That's correct. Case. The current use right now is a farm field with no stormwater attenuation or treatment so that agricultural use flows directly into the brook. Uh, with the development, there will be several uh, what we call best management practices which treat the stormwater prior to it discharging. And I would just like to note that the, the stormwater management system has been approved by the Piscataway Township Engineer. And in addition, we did receive approval from NJDEP, the Land Use Division, for our stormwater management design. Could, uh, I'm sorry, I just want one more question if I may. I, I just not clear, I don't un understand the runoff issue. I can understand the runoff issue with respect to not having any type of either above ground or below ground detention. But if that's part of the stormwater management plan and that's going to be in place, how does this pipe somehow diminish the runoff if the runoff's being collected either above ground or below ground? Um, the pipe doesn't diminish the stormwater, uh, well, the you, quality I, of the stormwater. I thought, I'm sorry, I thought that's what you indicated, that it was going to create a runoff problem on the erosion of the... No, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, let me uh, restate that. I apologize. The pipe will safely convey it. Uh, we have to get the water because the elevation of the site is higher than the actual stream itself. And so we're at an elevation here where, the, where we're treating the water, and we have to get it down to the elevation of the stream. Without the installation of the pipe, the water would just have to flow over the banks of the stream, which would cause an erosive velocity. So what we're doing with the pipe is we're taking the water and piping it, which is a concrete pipe, is very stable, and outlay and outletting it into the banks of the stream in accordance with the soil erosion standards of the state of New Jersey. You're saying that, that without the pipe, it would normally just flow over? I've never seen that with a detention basin, that it just flows that's, over. That's why tank. we're asking for the pipe, <laughs> is that but, we... But shouldn't does, isn't the purpose of the detention to allow the water to percolate? Uh, we do. There is a, a percolation basin, an infiltration basin with it, but in addition, there's... Um, it's impossible to infiltrate all of the water on the property. So you're um, saying the volume that's being created by the development is such that the, the that percolation isn't going to be sufficient to handle it in the restricted area that you have? Uh, well, the volume existing right now doesn't uh, percolate right now. So we're actually reducing the flow rate as part of the development into the stream. If you had a larger detention area, wouldn't that, would that address the problem as opposed to a smaller uh, detention area where you have Less uh, capacity? Due to the size of the site and the addition and the fact that water is actually 
coming from adjacent properties onto the property, it would not be feasible to infiltrate all of, all of the water on the property. Uh, just last question, Mr. K Tom, is, is so we approve this tonight to make the application. Our, is our role then completed? Does this come back to us at any point if we find additional information that we find troubling with respect to the application? Well, I think once, once you submit the application, the DEP then makes a final determination and does not come back to you. So if you couldn't put the, I'm sorry, last question. If you couldn't put the pipe in, what would happen? How would you build the project? Uh, it, it, would not, it would not be feasible to build the project if we cannot put the pipe in. We've performed several alternatives as part, the Green Acres uh, program requires us to perform several alternatives. And we did analyze not building the, constructing the pipe. And we've determined that it, it would not be sound engineering pro, pro, as practice as it would violate the standards for soil erosion and sediment control to not build the pipe. Any other questions? I don't think I understand the answer, but <laughs> any other questions? I can, I can restate it. It's, we, we looked at several alternatives. One of, one of them was not to build the project, which the project itself uh, is in uh, a state planning area one, which is a metropolitan area, so it's designated as smart growth. The buildings themselves are in compliance with the Township of Piscataway zoning. So the project itself the applicant decided to build. We looked at not constructing the pipe and it would violate engineering principles for erosion and stability. That, that's the part, and I'll leave it at this, that's the part that I don't understand. If uh, every development I've ever seen that I've been a part of when you create a detention basin, you size it to be able to accept the runoff and allow it to percolate accordingly. If you're telling me that you're creating too much water for a standard detention system to handle and you need a pipe to be able to evacuate the water, that I can understand, but that, that's not a violation of sound engineering principles. That's just maybe a matter of putting too much water into a fixed area. True? Um, the basins are sized appropriately. The, the issue is that it's currently over close to 180 CF cubic feet of water per second under the maximum design storm, which would be our 100-year storm here in Piscataway, um, flows into the brook. In order, it would be, the majority of developments built in the state do not infiltrate all of the water resulting from the development. What they do is they capture the water, hold it, and release it slowly. And that's what this project does. It, really, it holds the water and releases it slowly. Does this have to be done tonight? I mean, I, I think there's questions that I'm, I don't know if we've got all the answers to. I'll be honest with you, I'm satisfied to proceed with it given uh, where, where we stand uh, right now with, with what Mr. Kelsall told us. And, uh, I don't see a reason to hold it up. The ultimate decision is with, uh, with the state at this point once we uh, pass the resolution. Right. Okay. Anybody else from the public? Can I just add one more thing? Uh, you have a chance to, to talk later on in the um, meeting. Anybody else in the public? Yes, sir. Mr. Phillips. Free all as I rise tonight as the mayor of Oldbridge Township to uh, thank you for your consideration for the first three items on the agenda, uh, 1277, 1278, and 1279. Um, this is a project that has been very near and dear to us in Oldbridge Township. Uh, with your actions tonight, it allows us to preserve forever the open space, which is now known as the Cottrell Farm and as Whitney. Um, these uh, 58 acres are very important to us. It represents a historical site in Oldbridge uh, for many reasons, not the least of which, which is the fact that the, on this site, some years ago, Applejack was created as a, uh, as a liqueur. Anything that preserved takes gross. apples and turns it into a liqueur demands to be uh, saved. <laughs> this will bring us in Old Bridge to almost uh, 2,800 acres that the Middlesex County Board of Freeholders has worked with us 
to preserve forever as open space. What's unique about this opportunity is it is a combined operation between Oldbridge Township's Open Space Trust Fund, uh, the county's Open Space Trust Fund, uh, $1.6 million at least of Green Acres Trust money, and $200,000 which is being pledged by the Raritan Bay uh, Keeper, all to preserve this land forever as open space. And I thank you for this because I know that this is uh, uh, 58 acres represents a very small portion of the thousands of acres that have already been preserved forever, but it is a very important part to us. And I would like to thank uh, Ralph Albanier and Paul Clark and Tom Kelso for bringing the expertise necessary to pull this pull this off. Uh, we tried many years to come to a conclusion, but uh, it seems now that the, the time is right, the economics are there. Uh, I would say to you that four years ago, this property was being offered to the state for farmland preservation purposes alone for $25 million. It is now being acquired uh, and again to be preserved forever for uh, what's going to cost Oberage $2,444,000. Uh, we think this is a great uh, leverage of open space monies and particularly in Oberage, which uh, is 42 square miles but still has a tremendous amount of open space still available for us. So thank you for your consideration. And uh, thank you, Tom Kelso, who never gets any kind of recognition other than having his hair never out of place <laughs> for uh, <laughs> negotiating this deal. Thank you so much. Thank you. <coughs> Anybody else from the public? Motion to close. Motion to adjourn. You've, you've, spoken. you've spoken already, sir. I'm sorry. I said a motion to uh, close. Motion by Deputy Director Rios. Second. Seconded by Friela Valente. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. <laughs> Ayes have it. Is there any free order that has a resolution that they'd like to vote on separately and remove from the consent agenda? Yes, I do. I have three. Uh, resolution number 10-1386. Resolution number 10-1406. And one more, Resolution 10-1486. I have uh, three also. 10-1454, 1455, and 1456. Mr. Kelso? I, I believe here, Lepolis, there was one that... Yeah, I have one question for you, Tom. Uh, the Board of Directors for the hospital has been basically disbanded. Yeah. I'm serving on the McCarrick Care Center board now. Is that still considered I, I don't a think it really is the same thing. It's a separate entity. Yeah, so I think it's a separate entity. It's, it's not like a conflict any no, longer? I don't okay. Think so, no. Thank you. Okay. For answering that. I I'd like to pull tw uh, separate twelve eighty one out. <coughs> Mr. Kelso? Yes, uh, Friel, there's a motion would then be in order to adopt the consent agenda consisting of resolution numbers ten dash twelve seventy seven through 10-1498, including none that were previously held, and excluding resolutions 10-1329, 10-1434, 10-1445, and 10-1496, which were previously voted upon, resolutions 10-1356 and 10-1463 to be held, resolution 10-1483 to be voided, and resolutions 10-1386, 1406, 1486, 1454, 1455, 1456, and 10, 1281 to be voted upon separately. Hope you got all that. <laughs> I need a motion? So moved. I need a second. Second. Oh, motion by Deputy Director Rio, seconded by Freeholder Polos. Roll call. Freeholder Delina? Yes. Freeholder Polos? Yes. Freeholder Rios? Yes. Freeholder Valenti? Yes. Freeholder Director Rafano? Yes. I now Friel, the director, would be appropriate to consider the three resolutions which were <clears throat> set aside by Friel de Valenti. They are resolutions 10, 1386, 10, 1406, and 10, 1486. Any motion? So moved. Second. Motion by Deputy Director Rio, seconded by Friel de Polos. Roll call. Freeholder Delina? Yes. Freeholder Polos? Yes. Freeholder Rios? Yes. Freeholder Valenti? Present, not voting. Freeholder Director Rafano? Yes. Now, for the director, we can consider the resolutions which were set aside by you as director. They are 10-1454, 10-1436, 10-1437, 10-1438, 10-1439, 10-1440, 10-1441, 10-1442, 10-1443, 10-1444, 10-1445, 10-1446, 10-1447, 10-1448,
1014.55 and 1014.56. Any motion? Mm -hmm. So moved. Motion by Freeholder Valente, seconded by Deputy Director Rios. Roll call. Freeholder Delina? Yes. Freeholder Polos? Yes. Freeholder Rios? Yes. Freeholder Valenti? Yes. Freeholder Director Rafano? Present not voting. And finally, uh, the, that set aside by Freeholder Polos, which is Resolution 10 1281. Any motion? So moved. Second. Motion by Deputy Director Rio, seconded by Freeholder Valente. Roll call. Freeholder Delina? Yes. Freeholder Polos? Um, I've asked for it to be separate only because I think that we have still some questions that need to be answered and uh, I was hopeful that we could just hold it tonight to try to get some of those answers. I'm not comfortable completely with the answer that we received with respect to why the pipe has to be implemented, but um, I'm not necessarily opposing it, uh, but I, I feel uncomfortable proceeding to approve it for tonight. So I guess I'll cast a present not voting vote. Freeholder Rios? Yes. Freeholder Valenti? Yes. Freeholder Director Rafano? Yes. At this time, I'd like to open the meeting up to the floor. Anyone from the public? Any On any item. These are the ones that did not vote. Uh, Ed Marsh from Piscataway. Uh, I attended the Piscataway Planning Board meeting, which when the business, Piscataway Business Center on South Washington was approved, was introduced and approved on the, during the same evening planning session, making it virtually impossible for the, the public to even know about it. Um, the application for the business center does not conform to the zoning and environmental restrictions at the site. The warehouse construction includes very aggressive zoning variances and environmental waivers. I re don't have the paperwork in front of me, but I sort of remember something like a variance for zero foot frontage where 300 feet is required. Basically, I believe the site is being overbuilt. I also believe you were given incorrect information by the engineer here tonight. Uh, I also heard some talk here tonight about the, help, the helpers. Uh, whose farm was taken by eminent domain in Piscataway. Um, sort of led me to think that you were saying they had been paid. Uh, I know Lara and Clary Halper, who are members of the, fa the family, and uh, they were paid four million, four point two million, uh, right at the, at the time that they were evicted. However, they were, were awarded 18 million for, by the court, and they have not received that. And I know that Mr. Halper would like to know when he's going to be paid. I'm Rob Stevenson. I live at 7-11 Green Street, apartment 1A in Metuchen. And again, I wish you guys would reconsider, you men and women. Uh, nature has its own way of filtering pollutants and, and you know, when it's tampered with by developers in such a way that they they claim this will actually be cleaner and more effective for a better environment than leaving it natural and I just don't believe that I mean if you look at Katrina what happened in New Orleans if if people didn't begin to fill in those wetlands and build those levees the severity of that hurricane wouldn't have been nearly as bad Nature has a way of, you know, filtering pollutants and, 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 you know, when left alone, you know, we're okay. But again, I, I ask you to think like 10, 20 years down the road, you know, again, Bound Brook is underwater every five years. Bound Brook is flooded. It all empties into the Raritan River anyway. And it's just, there's just going to be more of that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, I have some other questions about, you know, um, I know that we're uh, in, in hard economic times. And I think Mayor Waller and the Township Council said it would provide 500 jobs, these two huge warehouses and this other, what is it, an office building they want to put in. But you know, most of those people are from outside of the township. Probably most of them are from outside of Middlesex County. And uh, 
you know, you really are not looking forward to what's going to happen 10, 20 years down the road. I grew up in Piscataway. It was a kind and gentle place to grow up when I was a kid. And there was plenty of room to breathe and clean air, lots of woods and fields to play in. And I know that, you know, growth can be positive if it's planned. I just don't think this is planned, right? And again, I ask you to reconsider. I, I, I'm, you know, I don't want to be taken as a Cassandra, you know. I mean, but 10, 20 years down the road, we're going to be in a lot of trouble if we continue to develop what, what little is left of uh, a natural environment in Piscataway. So that's all I have to say. Mary Ann Oberlings again. Uh, I really wish you would take a little peek through that book. There are some internet um, things that I have found out that kind of, you know, doesn't say what the gentleman in the engineering, he also doesn't live there. I live right there. I've seen what Duke Energy has done when they came and took a couple miles of trees. Well, it stopped the birds that used to migrate. They're still not back. Just from what we're doing right now on South Washington is going to impact all the migrating animals that we've got going through. We used to have birds and things that were magnificent. We had a park that had a beautiful big stream. And even I said, well, yeah, maybe it's better if they, you know, hold it up and make it a little safer. Well, they big stream, little tiny pipe. Well, now what happens? The park floods, our backyard floods, and if they hadn't have put a drain in front of our house last year, the street floods. And this is all from the same general woods. Everything is connected. South Washington floods, this is why they need the pipe. Because they're so close to this 100 year flood that they always talk about. But if you've ever get caught in a 15 minute rain between Stelton Road in front of the malls and any way across, you're not gonna get across Stelton Road because there's a giant flood. Because we still haven't taken care of what we need to. We need these small places protected. Even if, and of course it will go in because, and I don't wanna sound bitter, but I am, but what the township wants, the township's gonna get. They had little tiny signs put up on South Washington. If you're standing on South Washington trying to read the sign, whether it's six by six, 10 by 10, I challenged the suit people, drive up and go read your own sign. This is why Piscataway is not represented in this room because nobody knows what's going on. There's nothing on the Piscataway website that says anything about this is going on or we're going to fix this and we're going to do that. There's nothing on any kind of website. And I was kind of amazed because I'm not a computer person. I had a friend of mine. I said, well, can't you find that? Well, doesn't it have the agenda? Doesn't it? There's no information. And this has been the problem with my town, that the information does not get out to the people. In that book, you'll find a couple op-eds from different people saying the same thing back from 2002, because I'm one of those, oh, let me save that newspaper clip, let me save that little, and why they're yellowed is because they sat outside in front of my house to let everybody else know what's going on. Like I said, I'm, I'm really sorry that you had decided for this vote. I really wish that somebody somewhere would protect what's little left before historic River Road becomes four lanes and there is no more historic houses on River Road. Before you can't figure out that Piscataway was in the middle of the Revolutionary War. It was historic. Now, it's an overbuilt, overdone, over loud, over trucked community. And people are tired of it. We'd like to see these things change. We'd like to see instead of behind the South Randolphville Grammar School, the Verizon building, it used to be a horse farm. 
Now you can go back and you can hear the trucks blurring and blowing instead of the horses. We have very few beautiful choices in Piscataway to keep. Come down to my neighborhood. I'll show you where it is. I'll take you back there. It's magnificent. We can't lose places like this. And if we are, these people got to do better then. We will take care of it with a quote unquote maintenance code. No fertilizer, no pesticides, it's got to be green. And a regular, just old, everyday warehouse maintenance code should not work for these two warehouses when they do go up. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in the public? Mr. Stewart. Just, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I don't know whether uh, Freeholder Polos or the county engineer might be the better one to answer. Uh, I see around in the county in New Brunswick and uh, elsewhere these screens that are on the light poles that I believe are supposed to be uh, solar panel? Yes. Mm -hmm. How effective are they? I see them here and there. You know, it, I'm not sure they're, whether there's some pattern. I think they're and, put up, they're not ours. No, there, yeah. it's, it was a public service electric and gas initiative to utilize the poles to generate uh, solar through a grid that actually puts it back into the grid system. So it's a direct connect right back into the grid. Mm -hmm. um, there are shall I say, varying views as to the efficiency or cost effectiveness of having done the project initially, which is actually being done at ratepayers' expense, I might add. Um, but I'm not going to editorialize one way or another whether it was the most efficient installation of solar or not. Yeah, they seem to be sort of here and there. That's correct. I'm not sure. Is there some thought? as to where they're placing them? I don't know the answer to that, Mr. Stewart. I do know that they're in most communities that I've driven through in some form or fashion. I don't know if it's their goal to put them on every pole in every town. Uh, I believe that they're going in for approval for a second phase or may have already received the approval for a second phase. It's a pretty costly endeavor on a per kilowatt hour basis. So I don't know whether the BP will approve it or not, again, because it's a ratepayer expense. In other words, we pay for it out of our little gas and electric bills. <laughs> yes, that sounds good. Mm -hmm. um, I admitted before that I've missed a few meetings. Maybe I missed the meeting. When did you uh, appoint the members of the commission on the status of men? <laughs> 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 That's a good one, Mr. Stewart. <laughs> just wondering, just wondering. I don't want you to be accused of bias. <laughs> the uh, other thing I would just, as a closing thought, I listened to some of these proceedings and I can't help but remember that I grew up up in North Jersey in Lincoln Park in adjoining Wayne and I saw the planning people up there planning quote unquote uh, ended up approving construction of housing development after housing development in, New, in Lincoln Park and in Wayne uh, in what had been woodlands and fields. And it seemed that nobody realized that they were creating a water runoff problem. Uh, I don't know where they got their education in these matters, but I didn't think you needed a college degree 
to realize that water going into woodlands and fields is absorbed much more readily when, than when it's going into parking lots, paved parking lots. And if you watch every time we have rainfall now, I happen to live at that time. Uh, my father had bought a house that had been designed and built by a contractor for himself. Our house was the only one in the area that was specially built for floods. So we survived the floods with a minimum of uh, damage. But today, and then finally they got around. Unfortunately, the timing was bad for my father. He was selling the house to retire to Pennsylvania, and we had another high water period. Time. We had another high water period, and we ended up having uh, another flood just at that time. But we did, uh, he did get out without losing too much money. They dredged, and then for seven or eight years, they, we had Mr. no more floods. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have to, we'll, we'll continue but, this the next meeting, how's that? Uh, but I want to know, I want you to know, because the important thing is to know that there are two explanations for planning people that ignore this. One is that they're stupid, <laughs> and the other one is that they're crooked. Those are the only two explanations for okay. why supposedly intelligent okay, planning people sure. do these things. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else in the public? Motion to close. Second. Motion by Deputy Director Rios, seconded by Fred Apollos. Voice vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Ayes have it. Motion, motion, adjourned. motion by Deputy Director Rios. Second by Friel de Valente. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Ayes have it. Meeting adjourned. Nine o'clock.